Hi everyone. I'm just going to start this episode with a few announcements. Firstly, I want to correct an error that was made on last week's episode. I stated that Gillian had been buried in Market Deeping Cemetery. This was an error in my research, and she was actually buried in Deeping St. James, not far from where she was originally found. Apologies for the confusion, and thank you for those who have contacted me. Secondly, the website is now up and running. You can listen to episodes, have direct links to our social media, and also contact me directly through there. So please visit www.truecrimefixpodcast.co.uk That's www.truecrimefixpodcast.co.uk Thirdly, I just want to wish a very happy birthday to Michael from the In The City Like Yours podcast and a very happy birthday to one of my social media gurus, Jason. Hope you both have an absolutely amazing day. Fourthly, just a quick congratulations to Erin, Susan and Hayes, who won scripts last week. I will be running competitions like this again in the future, so stay tuned. Finally, just a quick plug for Patreon. That is www.patreon.com forward slash true crime fix podcast. I am trying to keep this show going and resist putting advertising in and interrupting your enjoyment. So if you are able, please join and get extra content for the price of a starter from that dodgy takeaway down the road. You'll know the one I mean. So that is www.patreon.com forward slash true crime fix podcast i'm going to run a couple of trailers for colleagues in the podcasting world and then on to this week's case how well do any of us really know the city in which we live we live in these metropolises full of strangers doing god knows what to god knows who When I was like 11, I saw a headline that made me realise I really didn't know my city. Adelaide is the murder capital of Australia, was what was announced down at me from the TV. And to be honest, that's when the true crime junkie in me began. Some of us refer to Adelaide as the city of churches. The government would like you to refer to us as the festival state. But to be honest, some of us call it Stabilade. I call it Murderlade. I'd like to welcome you to Murderlade, a true crime podcast hosted by me, full disclosure. I'm not a journalist, I'm the daughter of a cop, and I just want to share with you my beloved city's dark, sordid underbelly. I will dive deep into some of our most gruesome, fascinating, and underreported crimes that have given us the infamous title of Murderlade. The first few episodes will focus on the family murders between 1979 and 1983, including the first murder I remember watching the trial of. That's Murder Lied. Find it now on your favourite podcast platform. Dumb and Busted has been called, quote, one of America's greatest treasures by three out of three hosts of the show. Dumb and Busted is a weekly true crime comedy podcast with stories of exceptionally smart and insanely dumb crimes. Comedian Hunter Donaldson has hailed it as the greatest thing to come out of Portland since comedian Hunter Donaldson, who is me, also a host of the show. Podcasters Allison Copeland and Hannah Ether praise Dumb and Busted as, quote, found on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Just more rave reviews from two other people who host the show. Catch us every Thursday and follow us at Dumb and Busted on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Crime you later! True Crime Fix is a podcast with adult themes and graphic descriptions of crime, which may not be considered suitable for all ages. Please use your discretion when listening. All research has been conducted using material in the public domain 
and some opinions may not be that of the author or the host. Please remember that all victims are someone's loved one and all episodes are recorded in the utmost respect of their memory. You're listening to the True Crime Base Podcast with your host, Steve. Hello again everyone, and welcome to our 19th case together. If you've enjoyed the show so far, please remember to subscribe on your chosen podcast directory, and all of the new episodes will automatically download for you upon release. The case this week, although in the eyes of the law it has been resolved, is still shrouded in a vast amount of mystery. When doing cases like this one, although the crimes which happened to the victim were atrocious, people often forget those who have been left behind. In this case, the victim's parents have continuously had to relive the tragedy which has happened and the closure has been minimal. I cannot imagine the thought of any member of my family going off to do a routine activity with the intention of enjoying themselves only never to return home. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, this is your True Crime Fix. I am your host Steve and this episode has been written in the memory of Jenny Nickel. Jenny Nickel was born on October the 6th, 1985, in County Antrim, while her father, Brian, who was an army major, was on a tour of duty in Northern Ireland during the conflicts in the country. She was the final addition to the Nickel family. Her parents had met in Germany in 1970, while Anne was working as a nanny, and the couple's first son, Christopher, was born in January 1978 and the second James was born in October 1980. As a forces family, they were always on the move between Britain, Ireland and Germany, which meant that the boys were often at boarding school in Dorset. But when Chris was old enough, he joined the army and was posted to Catterick, just like Lee Rigby was in episode 10, leading to the family moving to Bolton Avenue in Richmond, Yorkshire, in 1997. The garrison was roughly three miles away. Richmond is a market town and is situated on the boundary of the Yorkshire Dales National Park. Founded by the Normans in 1071, the town was built around the castle which was situated on Richmont, which literal translation from French is Rich Mountain, but in folklore it is understood to stand for Strong Hill, hence how the town got its name. Richmond is also the home of the first gas works which were built in Europe. Jenny attended St Mary's Roman Catholic Primary School, where she was the first female to play for the school's football team, alongside ten boys. She had always been a bit of a tomboy, building tree houses and learning to skateboard rather than getting involved in the usual activities of a pre-teenage girl. Her parents admitted that as a young girl, trying to get Jenny to wear a dress was a real struggle. As a teenager, Jenny would often joke that she was emotionally and psychologically damaged when she was forced to wear a frilly frock to a birthday party. Even as a teenager, Jenny continued to enjoy her sports as well as the great outdoors. Being raised at the gateway to the Yorkshire Dales, Jenny and her close friend Terry were always up to mischief together. It was during her teenage years that Jenny found her passion for rock music and in particular the guitar. Her favourite performers were Jimi Hendrix Led Zeppelin, Nirvana, The Beatles and Pink Floyd. 
she joined a local band by the name of No Fouling. All the members had fun and worked hard to make something of themselves. Jenny's parents recalled many times yelling upstairs to her while she was rehearsing either the Razorlight song, Stumble and Fall, or Pink Floyd's Comfortably Numb, their pleas for the volume to be turned down, often falling on deaf ears. Jenny was five foot six inches tall, with a slim frame. She had green eyes and shoulder-length brown hair, which she often wore in a ponytail. Her skin was fair, and she had a fresh complexion from her love of the outdoors. Every year, there is a live music festival which is held in Richmond, at the Bats, which is an area of Wind Park. In 2002, No Fouling made it to the final of the Battle of the Bands competition, which featured a number of local bands. Unfortunately for all of the bands, though, that year, they did not get to play on the main stage. It rained for pretty much the entire week of the setup, and the Friday night had to be cancelled because the River Swale was up on the bats and lapping against the stage. The Battle of the Bands that night was hastily relocated to the Market Hall. Nevertheless, it was an amazing achievement. Jenny had a quirky sense of humour. For example, when she was in junior school, they held a class photo day. The school photographer asked pupils if they wanted to bring back their brothers and sisters after school to have their photo taken. Six-year-old Jenny at the time jumped at the chance, but decided she did not want her brothers involved. Instead, choosing to have her pet hamster Rocky in the picture. She even begged her mum Anne to check if this was okay. Anne recalled making the request on her blog years later. They said it was unusual, but acceptable nonetheless. We ended up having a happy six-year-old sitting with a hamster rather than a family photo. This was not the strangest request that Jenny made with regards to a family pet on the other hand. When she was a teenager, Anne recalled that Jenny had asked if the family dog Molly, who she adored, could have a Mohican-style haircut the next time she went to the groomers. Amazingly, Jenny got her own way, and Anne stated that they got some weird looks from dog walkers for weeks. To quote Anne directly, We're not sure what Molly thought about it, but Jenny was pleased with the new look. As she grew older, Jenny accrued a wide circle of friends within Richmond through her love of alternative music as well as playing pool in her local pub league. Jenny left school in 2002 with two unremarkable GCSEs and for several months worked for a firm in Catterick as an administrative assistant. She also worked at The Little Chef, but that did not last long. She was a terrible cook, her mother said later. By all accounts that I have read, Jenny attracted all of these friends due to her kind and caring nature, always eager to assist those less fortunate than she was. She was non-judgmental of the people that she met, without exception. Anne shared the recollection of one such event, demonstrating Jenny's caring side. On Christmas Day in 2004, at half past nine in the morning, Jenny came bounding down the stairs and asked her parents if they had any milk to spare. Their answer was, of course, at which point Jenny quickly got changed and took some round to a friend. When quizzed later on the act, Jenny simply replied, It was for someone who I know doesn't have much. Jenny and her family went on to enjoy their Christmas and Anne and Brian knew that someone else was enjoying it as well, that little bit more, due to the kind acts of their daughter. By 2005, Jenny had got herself a job with the co-op supermarket chain as a shop assistant. I've so far outlined a lot 
about Jenny as a person. And for the first time, not only because this podcast has always been directed to the victim, but I'm asking you please bear in mind all of this testimony so far as to Jenny's personality as this case unravels. On the 30th of June 2005, Jenny Nickel packed her grey rucksack and told her mum that she was off camping for the night. It was early summer and the weather was starting to get warm, so this declaration was not out of character. Wearing a pink sleeveless top, blue jeans with holes in the knees, a khaki duffel coat and black trainers, she loaded her things into her car, a white Rover 214i, and headed off down the road. Jenny had not disclosed to her parents with whom she was going out with, but as she was 19 and independent, they chose not to ask. The 30th of June was a Thursday, and when Jenny did not return the following day, her parents just assumed that she was going to make a weekend of it. A message was sent to Jenny's mobile phone, but the areas that she liked to camp in were remote and did not have great coverage for phone reception. When Jenny failed to return on Monday the 4th of July, however, and also failed to return to work, alarm bells started to ring and her parents decided to alert the police at 4pm as to her disappearance. Concerns grew later in the day when her mum found her white rover in the car park of the Holly Inn, which is on the southwest outskirts of the town. Following the initial report, a missing from home inquiry began immediately with the North Yorkshire Police. It was completely out of character for Jenny to be missing for this long without being in contact with her family. Unfortunately, the details of her last known movements were somewhat sketchy, so there were no leads for the police to start on. Detective Inspector Pete Martin was in charge of the investigation. On the 6th of July 2005, the police held the first of many press conferences, making an appeal to the local media for information about Jenny's disappearance. On the 9th of July, Jennifer Whelan, who was one of Jenny's closest friends, received a text message. It said, Hi Jen, tell Jack I'm okay. Know everyone's going to be mad. Tell them I'm sorry. Living in Scotland with my boyfriend. Shitting myself. Dad's going to kill me. Mum don't give a shite. Hope Nick didn't grasp me up. Keeping phone off. Tell Dad. Car jumps out of gear and stalls. Put back in auction. Tell him I'm sorry. At 12.16, Nicola Gosnold, who was the Nick referred to in the last message, received a text of her own. I quote, Thought you were grassing me up. Might be in trouble with me dad. Told mum I was leaving, didn't give shit. Been to Keswick camping, was great. Have to go. See ya. Both of the messages that were received at first glance appeared to be legitimately from Jenny. She texted in shorthand, which I appreciate it's hard to demonstrate in audio form, but for example she would use the number 2 to represent the word 2. But if these text messages were kosher, they raised a number of questions. What did Nicola know about Jenny that she was worried about getting out? Who was this mysterious boyfriend? Why was Jenny coming across different via text? Armed with these new text messages, the police set about tracing where Jenny's phone was last used. In the press conference which took place on the 10th of July, the police revealed that they were conducting house-to-house -house inquiries in Richmond, including searches of the local countryside and woodlands, 
which Jenny often frequented. They chose at this point to keep the information about the messages away from the media. The investigation team also indicated at the press conference that they were trying to trace all of Jenny's friends to eliminate all potential leads as well as gaining new ones. The Keswick, which was referred to in the text messages, was actually Keswick, which is a market town in the county of Cumbria within the Lake District National Park. When forensic teams conducted the investigation into the text messages, they discovered that they had originated from the city of Carlisle, which is 30 miles north of Keswick. It appeared as though the information in the text messages matched the evidence that had been discovered. Suspicion arose further, though, when it looked like the North Yorkshire Police's press conference had struck a nerve. Four days later, Brian received a text message from his daughter's phone. It read, Why do you hate me? I know Mum does. Told her I was going. I ain't coming back and the pigs won't find me. I'm happy living here. Everyone hates me in Rich. Only mate I got is Jack. Text you couple of weeks. Tell pigs I'm nearly 20, ain't coming back and they can shite off. She got me in the shit. It's her fault, not mine. Get blame for everything. I am sorry, okay. Just had to leave. She's a bitch. No food in and always searching me room and eating me sweets. Have to go, okay? I'm very sorry. Once again, this message was traced, and this one was sent from the town of Jebra, which is just across the Scottish border and a further 54 miles north of Carlisle. The next police press conference took place on the 15th of July, where Detective Inspector Peter Martin gave an update. He announced that every police force in the United Kingdom had been given the description of Jenny and North Yorkshire Police had been liaising with their colleagues in both the Lake District and Scotland following a tip-off that she might be camping in those areas. Yet again, however, they decided to omit the information about the text messages. D.I. Martin stated, I quote, 19-year-olds do go away without letting their loved ones know, but this was not Jenny Nichols' style. Officers today are conducting further house-to-house inquiries in the areas of Holly Hill, Sandbeck and Brooks, just outside of Richmond. Police still have to find the connection between Jenny and the Holly Hill area, Jenny is a country lover who enjoys camping but extensive searches of Holly Hill Woodlands have so far produced no clues. We asked residents of the area to think long and hard about whether they can help us with the name of an individual or a family that Jenny might have been visiting. Is there someone in that area who knows Jenny Nichol? but has not yet been contacted by the police. Following this appeal, the police were proactive in getting the search national. Appeals for help went out in Roman Catholic Church magazines. Posters were put in service stations along the A1, which is the road that leads from London to Edinburgh, passing through cities such as Doncaster, York, Sunderland and Newcastle. All of the pubs and shops in Richmond and Catterick Garrison put up posters. Friends and family members put up posters in cities as far afield as Edinburgh, Dundee, Aberdeen, Dumbarton, Keswick and Liverpool. Branches of the bakery, Baker's Oven, put up posters in all 66 branches 
and a hundred shopping malls in England and Scotland put up missing person posters. No new leads were gained when the next meeting with the media took place on the 21st of July. Brian Nicholl himself made an emotional plea to her friends in the local area to come forward and share any crucial information. He said, I quote, Anne and I have not seen our daughter since she set out from our home and we miss her. We worry about her and especially we need to know that she is safe and well. If there is anyone out there who knows where Jenny is or knows how to contact her, please call me or call the police straight away. One simple call could end three weeks of pain and anxiety. So please call now. D.I. Martin made a direct appeal to anyone who was staying silent to either protect Jenny or stay loyal to her, stating that Jenny was not in any trouble with either the police or her family. The next step for the police was to inquire with the patrons who participated in Richmond's nightlife. The police visited every pub in the town, Jenny was known in most of them, either through playing with no fouling or taking part in pool competitions. Jenny was known in particular for her drink of choice, which was called Diesel, but is also known as Snakebite in the UK. The drink consists of half a pint of cider mixed with half a pint of lager and a blackcurrant cordial. Speaking from experience, the drink is an incredibly sweet concoction. Officers were asking pub goers if they had seen any signs of Jenny since the 30th of June, which unfortunately nobody had. The police also arranged a series of visits and appeals to live music events across Yorkshire. A photo of Jenny with her Fender Stratocast guitar, an instrument made famous by the likes of Eric Clapton, Eddie Van Halen, and Buddy Holly. The investigation team believed that she may have reached out to people within this friendship circle, but again the police did not have any luck. Police did learn early on in their investigation that Jenny had been involved in a relationship with a much older man. When the police interviewed David Hodgson, they learned that the two had been involved in an affair since Jenny was just 14 years old. Although Hodgson maintained that they had not had sexual intercourse until Jenny was 16, and even then they had only had sex five times. Hodgson's daughters and Jenny attended the same school, the St Francis Xavier School in Richmond. The police, however, were already aware of a link between Jenny and Hodgson as they were called to an incident where Jenny had been assaulted by Hodgson's two daughters, although no charges were brought. Hodgson was married and was residing at Olav Road, just over half a mile from where Jenny lived, but the police had nothing which linked Hodgson to any foul play. Regardless, at the end of July, Hodgson was arrested for perverting the course of justice as he had not been truthful in his first police interview about his relationship with Jenny, where he denied knowing her. Nevertheless, a couple of days later, David Hodgson was found in a hut in a field near the village of Hudswell, less than three miles from Richmond. He had attempted to take his own life with an overdose of sleeping pills and wine. Hodgson was in a bad way, and was taken to hospital, but would go on to recover. In the subsequent interview, he revealed that Jenny and his affair had been broken off 12 months earlier, and that he had just learnt that she was seeing his older brother Robert since May 2005, and that had pushed him over the edge. But he maintained that he had nothing to do with Jenny's disappearance. The police were now at a bit of an impasse, however. 
they still did not know whether the text messages were genuine. They were starting to question whether Jenny had indeed run away. Robert Hodgson was forthcoming with the police and there was no evidence that he was involved in her disappearance either. The things that Jenny had packed on the day that she went missing had still not been found either. There was nothing at all indicating that anything was wrong apart from the disappearance being out of character. On the 6th of October, an appeal was made by Anne Nicholl, who went out and put two eight-foot banners in prominent positions in the town. The first was outside the co-op where Jenny used to work, and the other was outside the Georgian Theatre in the centre of town. The banners read, Happy birthday, Jenny, followed by the line, Jenny Nicholl is still missing. Can you help? The same message was placed by Brian and Anne in the free local newspaper. It was now three months since Jenny had gone missing and they needed to ensure that Jenny was still at the forefront of everyone's mind. The Nickel family also asked several radio stations to wish Jenny a happy birthday. TFM Radio which covered the Stockton on Tees area. Fresh Radio, which covered the towns of Skipton, Keeley, and Ilkley. And Garrison Radio, which covered Richmond and Catterick, all played a Jimi Hendrix track with a similar message that Jenny was not in trouble with her parents or the police and they just wanted to know that she was all right. In a press conference to mark Jenny's birthday, D.I. Martin said Jenny should be celebrating her birthday at home with her family. Instead, they have had three months of stress and anxiety. The family have now been without Jenny for over three months and it was becoming increasingly clear to North Yorkshire Police that they were not dealing with a missing persons inquiry anymore. The fact that there was no further contact with anybody in Jenny's friendship circle they were starting to question whether she was still alive. As a consequence of this, after consulting with Brian and Anne, on Thursday the 3rd of November, the police revealed that they had made the incredibly hard decision to turn this into a murder inquiry. Following the announcement, the Nickel family posted the following statement on their blog on the 9th of November. As expected, the media is having a bit of a frenzy at the moment after the press conference. Most of the sensible reporters, BBC, ITV, covered it with fact, but afterwards there were some that were trying to make 2 plus 2 make 5. We have always been aware that papers need to sell, and when any wee snippet of information was released, speculation would get worse. We are coping the best we can. Thank you, Brian and Anne. Family liaison officers in late November started discussing both scenarios with the family. Brian and Anne stating that the worst case scenario was becoming more inevitable and the time was right to deal with it. Brian added, Having said that, we still have hope. On the 8th of December, the local press reported that an area of Badger Beck Wood on the outskirts of Richmond had been cordoned off two days earlier with officers searching through the night. When the reporter spoke to a police spokesman, however, it was divulged that the searches had revealed nothing of any significance. Searches of various sites continued on a pretty much daily basis as part of the investigation. Locations included a disused well at Hudswell Grange. The site was an old abandoned farm on land owned by the Ministry of Defence where tactical manoeuvres could be practised. Yet again though, nothing of any significance was found. 
On Thursday the 13th of December, the case was featured on Crime Watch, with Anne and D.I. Martin travelling to London to make a live television appeal. During the episode, it was disclosed that some of Jenny's most treasured possessions were still missing, including an aluminium box where she kept all of her jewellery and her silver Goodman's CD radio cassette player. The programme also showed CCTV of Jenny withdrawing cash from a bank in the town shortly before her disappearance. Most significantly, the disappearance of her much-loved teddy bear. The statement basically being, you find the teddy bear and you find Jenny. The bear was being taken to a friend to have some patches sewn on it. When the car was found, the patches were inside, but the bear wasn't. They were also looking for Jenny's rucksack and Nokia 5210 mobile phone. The episode produced what the investigation team called helpful calls, but as 2005 came to a close, Jenny was still missing. On Tuesday the 17th of January 2006, however, the police released a statement to say that two men had been arrested on suspicion of murder and that searches around the woods had intensified. By the 20th of January, one of these men had been released without charge, but forensic teams were searching two houses in Richmond. The following day, the second man was released on police bail pending further inquiries. The police continued their searches throughout February and enlisted the help of the army so that they could comb a wider area. Just a quick geographical side note for anybody listening that does not know the area and is wondering why five months into the search they were not further along. The answer would be that the terrain and weather had made it very difficult to search at any speed but you also have to factor in that there are over 2,500 known caves which cover over 54 miles. It was at this time as well the police managed to accumulate a number of Jenny's text messages. They asked Dr Malcolm Coulter to take a look at the suspicious messages which had been sent shortly after Jenny had gone missing. Dr Coulter was a linguistics expert, studying it for over 40 years. He was an expert witness on such cases as the Birmingham Sixes Appeal, a group of six Irishmen who had been found guilty in 1975 of bombing two pubs in the city centre, killing 21 people, the decision being overturned in 1991. The Bridgewater Four who were found guilty of the murder of Carl Bridgewater in 1978 in Stourbridge in the West Midlands. Their convictions were overturned in 1997 on technical grounds. He was also a witness on the Roger Bodden trial, who alleged interference with evidence by the West Midlands Police Serious Crimes Unit. More on Dr Coulthard's investigation later. On the 20th of March 2006, the police's searches of the woodlands finally found items relating to the Jenny Nicholl case. The road, Longwood Bank, runs through a dense area of trees known as the Sambeck Plantation. It was here that the search teams recovered two items of significance. Firstly, they found Jenny's teddy bear. Police believed that it had been unearthed when a tractor wheel had run over it. The second find was Jenny's portable stereo. Both items linked Jenny to the Sambeck plantation, but there was still no sign of Jenny's body. Police continued to canvass the area, hoping to find other clues as to what she was doing there. Despite the finds, the trail went cold again. By this time, 
police had followed up on 3,600 inquiries, generating 4,300 documents, which included 1,020 statements and conducted fingertip searches across more than 150 areas. On Friday the 30th of June 2006, exactly one year to the hour that they last saw their daughter, a church service was held by Brian and Anne in honour of Jenny. A eulogy was read by Mary Quirk, Jenny's aunt. It outlined a lot of the anecdotes that I used at the start of this episode. The service itself was standing room only at St Joseph and St Francis Xavier Catholic Church at New Biggin. Friends, family and members of the police force all attended. The collection plate on the day paid for donations to the National Missing Persons Helpline and the music department at Jenny's High School. Friday the 6th of October 2006 would have been Jenny's 21st birthday. Her family requested that a candle was lit by everybody in the village. Christmas time came with no further developments. The family placed tea lights in every shop, inviting people to take one into their home and light one for Jenny over the holidays. A Christmas tree was placed in the co-op where Jenny worked, with mock presents with her face on them hung from it. Behind the scenes, the police were taking a second look at the Hodgson brothers, who were both known to have had affairs with Jenny. Both men could be linked to the Sambeck plantation as they had both built SAS-style hides in the area. Hides are like miniature air raid shelters made from corrugated iron and wood where they used to sit in camouflage and drink beer. David Hodgson was born in 1960 and although he was a fence erector by trade, He had not worked since 1991 when he had had an accident. Subsequently, he had had to have lumbar surgery in 1991 and 1995, which led to pains in his joints and the diagnosis of a degenerative disease. He would work in short bursts and would subsidise his income by selling things such as golf balls and other items that he would find on the moors at car boot sales around the area. David Hodgson married his wife in 1983 and had two daughters. Again, as in previous cases, I'm leaving their information out of this through choice. Both men were the ones who were arrested back in January 2006 and David was still on bail. With the evidence that was found in the vicinity of his hut, his vast knowledge of the terrain and the revelation during his first interview that he had only recently learnt of his brother's relationship with Jenny. On the 16th of May 2007, David Hodgson was charged with the murder of Jenny Nicholl. He appeared at North Allerton Magistrates Court where he pled not guilty but was remanded in custody until his trial would begin in 2008. Despite the arrest, the Nickel family still did not have any closure as Jenny had not been found. A new location was searched on the 18th of May, a septic tank on a farm between Richmond and Catterick Garrison, but nothing was found. Hodgson's trial began on the 14th of January 2008 at Teesside Crown Court in Middlesbrough. James Goss QC was prosecuting. Jamie Hill QC was representing Hodgson. And Judge Mr Justice Peter Openshaw was presiding. The jury consisted of six men and six women. Before I go into the trial in detail, I'm just going to take a sidestep and just back up a little bit to the linguistics expert Malcolm Coulthard's research into the text message 
and give you the Cliff Notes version of the findings. The study analysed known text messages sent by Jenny to those sent after she went missing. If you are interested in the full study, I'll post a link to Dr Claire Hardacre's review in the True Crime Fix discussion page on Facebook. There are significant differences between the two sets of text messages. For example, habitual spacing. Jenny's texts would use to say, see you tomorrow, see you to Moz. Using the letters C and U and the number 2 with no spaces. Whereas the texts sent after would use AV2 space go. AVE2 space go. Sign offs. Jenny would use see you kiss. And the second text would say see ya with no text. Other examples included the words shit and shite, myself and me self, as well as the spelling of phone, with Jenny spelling it F O N E. All very subtle differences, but definitely different from the way that Jenny texted. All showed that they were sent by someone who knew Jenny's style but confused it with their own style. At the trial, Mr Goss QC outlined the information known about Jenny's disappearance to open. He claimed to the court that David Hodgson had killed Jenny out of blind jealousy, that she was getting closer to his brother Robert and that she had been in his hide despite claiming that she had never been there. Mr Goss said, I quote, The prosecution's case is that the defendant murdered Jenny the night that she disappeared and disposed of the body somewhere in the neighbouring countryside with the intention of it never being found. So this is a case where there is no body. Jenny simply disappeared. Nor is there a crime scene. We cannot point to a location and say for sure this is where she was killed. He then went on to address the secret hides in the woods. Scientific evidence will show that Mr Hodgson and Miss Nicholl had sex in two hides, which the defendant and his brother had built in Richmond. Other evidence that was found at the hide closest to where Jenny's possessions had been found was a drinking game which was given to Jenny by her parents in 2004 as a Christmas present. Mr Goss continued. Jenny had told a friend about her ongoing affair with a married man since she was 15 and how he had kicked off when he had seen her with another boyfriend whom she had split up with. This evidence of possessive jealousy has relevance to the last weeks of Jenny's life in Richmond. The afternoon that Jenny went missing, Hodgson had also told his family that he was going camping. The prosecution then introduced the evidence about the texts and said that Hodgson had tried to make it appear as though she had just run off. David Hodgson took to the stand in his defence and admitted having lied to the police but denied murder. Hodgson tried to claim that Jenny had been abused by her own father and that she was alive the last time that he had seen her. Mr Hill QC asked Hodgson if he had killed Jenny, to which he replied no and denied knowledge of her whereabouts. He admitted that he had lied, saying that he had had sex with her five or six times the year before she went missing. When asked why he had lied, he simply said, to cover my own arse I think, I'm not sure. He also claimed to have spoken to Jenny twice since she had disappeared, 
but forgot to tell the police. When asked about his lies by Mr Hill, Hodgson replied, I'm not proud of it. If I told the truth, I would not be here. He maintained that Jenny had never been in his hide and that her DNA had got on the foam mattress as it was the ones they used when they were camping. He claimed that he knew that Jenny planned to leave due to her home life and she had asked him where she could get rid of her car. He said he gave her £3,000 and then claimed that Jenny had often talked about different places such as London, Paris and the United States. Hodgson had hired a Vauxhall Corsa the day after Jenny had gone missing but was unable to explain the mileage discrepancy between his explanation of the car usage and the miles recorded by the hire company. The trial lasted five weeks and Brian recalled on his blog after the trial, I quote, Many of Jenny's close friends were reduced to tears in the witness box as the defence attempted to paint a picture of Jenny that she was a drunkard, a drug addict, a drug dealer and her hypothetical dating habits. I doubt very much that any of these young people would ever consider giving evidence to an investigation again as many of them were unnecessarily humiliated and intimidated into agreeing to what appeared to be a very selectable strands of truth or depraved allegations made by the defence. After ten hours of deliberation over two days, the jury of six men and six women unanimously found that David Hodgson was guilty of murder. The judge, Mr Justice Openshaw, said, The defendant's concealment of her body has prolonged the anguish and agony of her family and friends as they waited for news of her fate. After he killed her, the defendant retained her mobile phone and on two separate days sent bogus text messages from the phone as if from her, first to her friends and then to her father, cruelly pretending that she was still alive and that she had run away. He was, of course, intending thereby to prevent the missing persons inquiry turning into a murder investigation. Naturally, her family found any slight hope that the messages might be genuine and so their uncertainty extended from weeks to months until the gradual realisation that she must be dead and that she had been murdered. Even now, they have been denied such solace as can be found from a funeral and from providing for her a decent, dignified and reverent disposal of her remains as they wish. I do not doubt that the thought that she is laying somewhere up on the moors will continue to inflict further pain on her long-suffering family. The defendant has shown not the slightest regret or remorse. Where he had hidden and disposed of the body, only the defendant knows, because on these matters he had remained silent. No doubt he buried her somewhere in the woods or threw her body down one of the many potholes or mine shafts which are found throughout Swaledale. The defendant then casually returned home in the morning, greeting his wife as if nothing happened. He sentenced Hodgson to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 18 years. This means that he would be eligible for parole in the year 2026. Outside of court, Jenny's parents, Anne and Brian, appeared relieved with the verdict. In a statement, the family said 
that there were still many questions unanswered relating to their daughter's murder. They said it was their deepest wish to know where Jenny's body was so that they could bury her with dignity and respect that she deserved. Chief Superintendent Sue Cross from North Yorkshire Police said, Throughout the investigation and now the trial, Hodgson has failed to accept responsibility for his actions and has deprived Jenny's family of any sort of explanation for her death or where he disposed of the body. He's tried to lie and bluff his way out of trouble and possibly even convinced himself that he is innocent. I only wish he will now have the decency to reveal where Jenny's body is so that her parents can finally allow their daughter to rest in peace. Of course though, Hodgson did not tell the parents anything and he also appealed the decision of Judge Openshaw. On the 31st of March 2009, Hodgson's appeal was heard at the Royal Courts of Justice in London. The three appeal court judges ruled that there was compelling evidence that David Hodgson had killed Jenny. The appeal centred around new evidence from another forensic linguist. Lady Justice Hallett commented that the new evidence did nothing to boost the defence's case. Judge Hallett, in her summing up, said that Hodgson had become prone to manhandling Jenny, traits that he had displayed with others throughout his meagre life. Anne and Brian are still waiting for answers as to what happened to Jenny. In 2009, Brian posted on the fourth anniversary of Jenny going missing. We think of her daily, and as we watched the Glastonbury Festival over the weekend, we wondered which bands Jenny would have liked and which songs she would have been trying to learn on her guitar as she strummed away in her bedroom. On the 30th of June 2012, for the seven-year anniversary, the Nickel family visited the Sambeck plantation where Jenny's items were found. The couple put up a poster with a new picture and the message, Those we love are only a thought away. The last update from this case came on the 5th of July 2019, when the Secretary of State for Justice, David Gork, confirmed the adoption of Helen's Law in England and Wales. Marie McCourt, whose daughter Helen was murdered in 1988, but her body was never recovered, had fought for this law. The brief description of Helen's Law is murderers who refuse to reveal where their victim's body is hidden will automatically be denied parole until they share the resting place of their victims. The hope is that with this law in place now, maybe with his freedom on the line, David Hodgson may grow a conscience. Jenny would have been 34 this year, the same age as me. In fact, you may have picked up on it. It would have been her birthday last Saturday. If you're aware of any information which would help find Anne and Brian closure, you can contact Crime Stoppers anonymously on 0800 555 111. That is 0800 555 111. Hopefully, they will eventually be able to lay their daughter to rest. Just a quick additional note, since writing I thought I would do my due diligence and reach out to the North Yorkshire Police to see if the two Cumbria locations had been searched and I got the following email back from the cold case review team. It started. Thank you for your interest in the case. I can confirm that the remains of Miss Nicholl have not been recovered. It is a sad fact that at this stage the person who knows what happened to her remains 
has declined to allow the family to know that she has truly been laid to rest. Extensive inquiries have failed to locate those remains. All policing searching is undertaken for a specific investigative end and inquiries were unable to identify any specific locations that have not been searched. Unfortunately, at the time of recording, the police have now exhausted all leads. So that is it for this week. Please remember, if you enjoy the show or want to know more, please follow us on Twitter, at True Crime Fix Pod. That's at True Crime Fix Pod on Twitter. The podcast also has a Facebook page, True Crime Fix Podcast, but there's also a fan page, True Crime Fix Discussion. I'm thoroughly enjoying interacting with everyone on there and this is where I post the majority of the information on the week's cases. Also a reminder that the podcast is now on Patreon so please visit www.patreon.com forward slash true crime fix podcast that's www.patreon.com forward slash true crime fix podcast I also have an Instagram account, so please search True Crime Fix. Also, if you have any suggestions or feedback for the show, please contact me at truecrimefixpodcast at gmail.com. That's truecrimefixpodcast at gmail.com. Until next time, stay safe, look after each other, and live life to the fullest, because you never know who or what will be coming around the next corner. Take care, everyone.